Guru Larry merch is finally now available at Pixel Empire. Order now for a chance to win one of four $50 gift cards. With the ever-increasing development time of video games, you'd think they'd be finely tuned to a T. But as we all know in this day and age, nothing could be further from the truth. However, some of these games are so poorly made and rushed out the door that they are literally impossible to complete. Not because of their difficulty, oh, oh goodness no, but good old fashioned ineptitude. So this episode, I take a look at these futile formations, these pure role productions, and these naive nascencies, as I say, but hello you. I'm Guru Larry, and I welcome you to Fact Hunt, five completely broken, unbeatable games thanks to developer stupidity. Ah, everybody loves Bubble Bobble. It's the Tom Hanks of video games. The maze-crawling adventure of two devolved overweight dinosaur children entombing enemies with their spit has engrossed the world for nearly four decades now. So when Taito announced an updated version of the classic percolating platformer in 2005, gamers were reasonably interested. I mean, be honest, this is Bubble Bobble we're talking about here in seeing Bub and Bob's latest incarnation. Unfortunately, as you can probably guess, if it's on this list, something's bound to have come a cropper with the game, and that's exactly what happens when you get to the 30th level. Now, level 30 is a boss fight. So, what do you think would be the most important thing to have in a boss fight? Spikes all over the walls? Annoying constantly respawning enemies? Having a shed load of health packs before the encounter? Nope, the most important thing to have in a boss fight is a blooming boss! Yup, in Taito's eagerness to get the game out in stores in time, they completely forgot to add a boss in the level. So once you get to level 30, you're stuck there in limbo for all eternity, waiting for a boss that will never come, and totally incapable of ever progressing to the rest of the game, as it uses battery backup rather than passwords. Brilliant! On the plus side, the North American publishers Codemasters were kind enough to announce a recall of the game where anyone who sent their copy of Bubble Bubble Revolution in would receive a patched copy. Four months later, when they had printed some. You couldn't make this up! Let's travel all the way back to the neon field days of 1982 and the launch of GCE and Milton Bradley's Vectrex. Well, more specifically its bundled game, which is totally not ripping off asteroids, Mindstorm. Now, Mindstorm was a pretty decent packing game for a console. Probably quite mind-blowing to play a genuine vector-based clone of asteroids in the comfort of your own home at the time. However, what was even more mind-blowing is the developers never bothered testing the thing. That's all they are no good at their own game. As once you got to the 13th level, the game would crash, instantly destroying your high score and any progression you had made. GCE and MB were fully aware of this issue, as anyone who wrote to them and complained would receive a free copy of Mindstorm 2, which is the exact same game, just it didn't crash this time. Hmm, turning a less buggy revision into a sequel? Where have we seen that before, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> Mindstorm 2 is also an unbelievably rare game nowadays, one of the holy grails of collectors in fact. So either no one who bought a Vectrix was any good at the game, or they just didn't want to kick up a fuss. But at least we have one of gaming's first ever examples of releasing an unfinished game. We had a chance to nip this in the bud, people! Yes, we did nothing! <laughs> oh, the humanity! The 
Japanese to English translation errors in video games have often ranged from the baffling, downright hilarious, to even legendary meme status. But our next example of a translation error is so stupid, it literally stopped you from finishing the game. When Crave Entertainment released Tokyo Extreme Racer 3 for the PS2 in the US, they thought, Oh dang, a game set in the Japanese capital just ain't American enough. So the first thing to go was the use of yen as currency in the game. However, you can't just use the same numerical value by simply changing the yen symbol to a dollar sign. The cars would look ridiculously expensive by comparison. So thinking they were smart, Crave just divided all yen values by 100 to give more realistic looking dollar prices. Unfortunately, what Crave didn't do was also adjust the yen to dollar values to challenge other racers. And the entry fee to challenge the final boss, Whirlwind Fanfare, was 100 million yen slash dollars. But unbeknownst to Crave, the game caps out at 99,999,990 dollars. In other words, Tokyo Extreme Racer 3 is literally impossible to beat, as you can never physically have enough money in the game to challenge the final boss. Of course, workarounds were discovered to fix this issue, namely an infinite money code via a game shark or action replay. But if you have to personally fork out $60 to fix such a schoolboy error, is it even worth purchasing the game in the first place? One of my all-time favourite gaming anecdotes, this story. Now, despite going down as the worst selling console in history, <laughs> yes I did a video on that, the C64 GS's biggest boneheaded move wasn't trying to release an 8-bit console based on nearly decade old technology when 16-bit consoles were hitting shelves. Oh no sorry, it was in fact Commodore trying to ship the system with Terminator 2. What could possibly be wrong with that, Larry? I hear you ask. Bundling a system with a video game adaptation of one of the most popular movies of all time would be a surefire hit and would guarantee sales. And well, yes, you'd be right. If it wasn't for one tiny overlooked issue. You see, deep down, the C64 GS is literally just a regular Commodore 64 without a keyboard. It didn't even innovate having a cartridge port, as the C64 had one since it was first released back in 1982. So when Commodore commissioned Ocean Software to develop a cartridge based port of Terminator 2 for their upcoming console, Ocean simply used a normal Commodore 64 to develop the game on, as both systems were 100% compatible with one another. Well, 99.9% .9 compatible. Developing the game just like any other C64 title, Ocean always let you start the game by simply pressing the return key. And as the C64 GS didn't have a keyboard, that was a bit of a problem. So you literally couldn't progress any further than the title screen in Terminator 2, simply because Ocean programmed the start button the C64 GS didn't have. Of course, Commodore and Ocean didn't realise this massive foobar until after the game had gone to print. So Commodore quickly pushed out an incredibly cheaply made flimsy cartridge for the C64 GS's launch instead. Consisting of old games such as Flimbo's Quest, Fiendish Freddy's Big Topo Fun, Clax, and the by then ancient 8 year old C64 game, International Soccer. Lumbered with thousands of useless Terminator 2 cartridges, Commodore simply bundled them with a regular Commodore 64 instead. Which, in a huge twist of irony, proved so successful, it destroyed sales of the C64 GS. As, in all honesty, who wanted a system without a keyboard and wouldn't let you play thousands of super cheap cassette and disc based games for just £50 less? In fact, it got to the point they recalled the C64 GS to convert them back into regular Commodore 64s to meet demand and recoup their losses on the failed console. And people wonder why Commodore went out of business.
However, on the list of unbeatable games because they crash or glitch out, you would have thought one where you couldn't even get off the bloody title screen would have been our number one entry. But our final title manages to even beat that. <laughs> Everyone, welcome to John Madden Football. We'll end this episode with a story that I'm surprised has fallen out of memory, especially with the publisher's constant track record of treating their audience like utter dirt. In the days before scamming their consumer base with loot box, I mean, surprise mechanics, Electronic Arts thought it would be far more profitable to just release unfinished games instead. And one needs to look no further than this than their second biggest sports franchise, Madden NFL, and its 2006 incarnation for the PSP. Now, playing Madden 06 in exhibition mode is perfectly fine, but dare you have the audacity to play the franchise mode, and every time you turn the ball over, for instance, throw an interception, the game would crash so hard it would literally switch off the PSP, essentially soft bricking the handheld and losing all your progress. Now, for something that is reasonably common within an American football game, you'd have thought EA would have picked up on this during playtesting. But only after mass protests on the Madden forums did the House of Hawkins finally acknowledge and respond to this massive issue. So, what did EA do? They obviously offered a heartfelt apology, immediately released a patch fixing the issue, and recalled all copies of this literally broken game, right? <laughs> no, of course not. This is EA we're talking about here. No, they put out a press release telling people to deal with it. Yep, EA decided that this game killing bug didn't receive enough complaints to warrant wasting their time on fixing, as anyone who was affected could go screw themselves. It was their problem now, not EA's. Players did finally discover a rather exhaustive workaround to this crashing issue, which was to quit out of the game and create a brand new save every single quarter to minimise any potential loss. But it's insane why anyone would want to continue using a completely broken product at full price sold by a publisher who demanded players sort out the issue themselves. Wow! Hi folks, welcome to John Madden Football. Get ready for some real hard-hitting action. Hello you. Thanks ever so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe to be first to see future Fact Hunt episodes. Click on the bell if you already are to make sure you're notified. And be sure to check out my other episodes. And if you want to be super awesome, check out my Patreon. But thanks again for watching and I'll be seeing you next time. Ta-ra for now.